going to start learning about how to take vital signs for our residents. So when we're talking about vital signs, they are measurements of the body's vital functions, and they provide information about the patient's physical well-being. So we're going to be looking at temperature, which is just the measurement of balance between heat lost and heat produced. We're going to look at the pulse, which is how many times your heart beats in one minute. We'll look at respirations, the number of time a person breathes in one minute. Blood pressure, which is a fluctuating pressure that the blood exerts against the arterial walls as the heart contracts and relaxes. Pain level. And then in some agencies, pulse oximeter is always going to be listed under vital signs. If you're working on a cardiac floor or in an intensive care unit, generally anytime you do vital signs, you'll automatically get a pulse ox as well. If you work on a regular medical surgical floor or in um, a nursing home, not so much. It will be temperature, pulse, respirations, blood pressure, and pain. So when we start talking about vital signs, um, one thing to keep in mind is it's really important we do correct measurements. We don't just guesstimate. So if you're not sure what you're hearing, if you're not 100% um, sure you heard that correctly, you can do it again. And if you're still not sure what it is, you need to check in with the nurse. It's, their medications can be adjusted to their, the vital sign measurements that you get. And so if we're not sure what we're hearing, we're not sure we're doing it correctly, we always need to make sure we get some help with that. Generally, vital signs are going to be taken while the person is laying down or sitting down. And we'll talk about that. Um, there are actual times when we do do vital signs laying down, sitting, and standing. But as a general rule, laying down or sitting down is when we're going to get our vital signs. We want to record our results right away. So after we get our vital signs and we wash our hands, we want to record our results while we can still remember the numbers. Um, repeat the procedure if you're not sure, um, and then report the results to the nurse right away if there's any significant change, if something is worse, if the values are, are you know abnormal, we need to make sure we notify the nurse. What we don't want to do is alarm the patient. So you don't want to take someone's blood pressure and say, oh my gosh, that's the highest blood pressure I've ever heard. That's probably not going to help them too much. So we'll start with temperature. And we said the body temperature is the amount of heat in the body. And it's regulated by the hypothalamus. So it is your body's built-in thermostat. And heat is produced by um, the cells when they're using food as energy. So when you're using your foods and it's being converted into energy, it produces heat. We lose heat through our skin, through our breathing, through our urine, and through our bowel movements. Now there are a lot of things that your book talks about that can impact body temperature, but I'm going to just kind of um, talk about a few of them. Environment, for instance, if you're in a really hot environment, your temperature is going to go up and vice versa. If you're in a really cold environment, your temperature can de decrease. We have to keep that in mind. So if we're working, say, in a nursing home and it's really high temperatures, we've had these really uh, a big heat wave going on, it's really important we keep our patients hydrated and we keep them cool. The time of day. Usually your temperature is lower in the morning when you get up um, because you haven't been eating, you haven't been expending energy. So after you start getting up and your metabolism is increasing and you're using your food, you're eating and you're using your foods being converted into um, energy, so that's producing heat. So it's usually going to climb as the day progresses. And then exercise. As we exercise, that will also increase um, our temperature. So normal temperature values, um, an oral temperature is 98.6 plus or minus one degree, so 97.6 to 99.6. Um, a rectal temperature is usually a degree higher. Now, I have to be honest with you, it's been probably 15 years since I've taken a rectal temperature on a patient. It is not generally something with the advent of tympanic and temporal thermometers. It is not usually something we do anymore. But if you did have to do a rectal temp, it's usually a degree higher. Axillary, the axilla is under the arm, so an axillary temperature is putting the thermometer under the arm. It is usually a degree less than um, the oral temperature. Your tympanic is right about equivalent to an oral thermometer or an oral temperature, and your temporal artery is actually supposed to be more equivalent to a core body temperature, which is going to be more um, consistent, like with a rectal temperature. <coughs> Now, as far as fever goes, 
The term fever means elevated body temperature. And you may hear someone refer to it, they'll say he's febrile, and that means with temperature, okay? So febrile means they have an elevated temperature or a fever. No fever is the term afebrile. A in front of a word means without or absent or lack of. So afebrile is lack of fever, <clears throat> lack of um, elevated body temperature. So there are different types of thermometers that we may use. There is electronic or digital th thermometers, which are very reliable. They usually can um, measure your readings in a few seconds. They have individual plastic sheaths to help prevent infection. They usually will display in either Celsius or Fahrenheit for you, depending on what, um, what your facility uses as far as their standard. Um, and they, a lot of times, are color-coded. So oral temperatures will usually have a blue probe on them. So when you do oral temperatures, and oral is under the tongue, you know, through the mouth, there is usually a blue tip on it, letting you know that that thermometer should only be used for oral temperatures. And, and you can use the oral temperature ones for axillary as well. The red-tipped thermometers are for rectal temperatures, and you never would then use a rectal temperature later for someone else orally. Even though they have plastic sheaths on them, that's just disgusting. So your blue coated on the top are for oral, the red are for rectal. Um, tympanic, which is going in the ear, is um, another way that we will do. So oral is under the tongue, so in the mouth. Rectal is in the rectum or the bottom. Tympanic is in the ear, where you're going to get the temperature against the tympanic membrane. And temporal is across the temporal artery, which is on the, in the forehead. So they all come electronically or digitally nowadays. Um, there is also paper thermometers, and there's also strips, which can give you a general indication. They're not considered as accurate, but they can give you a general idea of how the person's body temperature is doing. So when we start with a, the different types of temperatures, we'll start with oral, which we, we said is by mouth. So generally, we are going to put the um, tip of the thermometer down at the heat pockets, which are down under the tongue. Um, the thing for this is for you to be able to get an oral temperature, the person has to be able to follow directions and they have to be able to breathe through their nose. So if they are mouth breathers, this is not going to be an accurate way to measure it. So generally if they're mouth breathers, if you have small children under five, which who don't normally follow directions real well or keep their mouth shut the whole entire time, if they have facial paralysis where they can't hold the thermometer under their tongue or nasal obstruction where they need to be able to breathe through their mouth, we will use an alternative method. The other thing is, is if the patient has smoked or had hot liquids, um, cold or hot liquids for that matter, so if they've had a glass of ice water or they just had a cup of coffee, we have to wait 15 to 20 minutes before we're going to take their temperature. And they do have probe covers. Now this is actually showing you an old style glass thermometer. And you, your book is actually still talks a little bit about glass thermometers and how to read them. And we do not teach that to you anymore in this class. I have not seen a glass thermometer in a bazillion years. There's mercury in them. Facilities are not allowed to use them because if the glass, if you drop the thermometer, it breaks and mercury is a hazardous substance. So they just don't make the glass thermometers anymore. So we aren't going to take the time to learn how to read a glass thermometer because that is an art all in, in and of itself. But um, the digital thermometers that go in the mouth, they will have probe covers on them so you, so you don't have to sit there and re-sanitize it the, or the entire um, thermometer. When we're doing a temperature rectally, so rectally means in the bottom, um, the way we do this is the best position to put them in is a Sims position. And remember your Sims position, you roll in a left Sims position at that. Roll them on their left side. Um, you want to sharply flex the top leg. And so it kind of rolls them over a little bit. So they're half sideline, half prone position. It opens up the bottom really well. So for rectal temperatures, um, it's a really great way to be able to do that, uh, to get your um, temperature. You would want to wear gloves. We would use KY jelly, and we're going to insert the bulb of the thermometer. Um, for infants, about a half inch. Um, for um, children, a half inch to an inch. And for adults, about an inch. And you have to hold it the entire time. You can't just stick the thermometer in there and then walk away from the person. You want to make sure that you're holding it the entire time it's in the bottom. So if they can't, 
you don't want them to accidentally fall back or roll back on it because then it could actually puncture something. It could puncture part of the bowel or the rectal area. Now, the type of patients you could do this for, so let's say they're unconscious and they can't hold a thermometer in their mouth. Um, let's say they have, there's reasons why they can't breathe, you know, they can't breathe through their nose, so we can't do an oral temperature. We could do a rectal temperature. It used to be the best alternative if you didn't have, if, you could, if a person couldn't do an oral temperature. But with the advent of tympanic and temporal, and especially temporal being as, as prominent as it is now, it's very unusual to see rectal temperatures done anymore. Um, if you do use a rectal temperature, we avoided in really fragile newborns, active children, because you can't trust them to be still, and if they're thrashing around when you're trying to do a rectal temperature, again, you could potentially perforate or poke the thermometer right in the bowel, you know, and, and um, cause some damage. Patients that have had rectal surgery, of course, we would not want to put the thermometer in there. And then recent cardiac patients. Now, the reason we say recent cardiac patients is you actually have a vagus nerve that runs from the heart to the rectum. And when the vagus nerve is stimulated, so if you put a rectal temperature in there, you stimulate the vagus nerve, it actually slows the heart rate down. And so for most people, that would not be a problem. But if you have someone who's just recently had heart surgery or had a heart attack or had some kind of cardiac event going on with them, it is probably that that is one way you would not want to do the temperature and then if you have a patient that's with dementia who tends to get aggressive or combative with you when you're giving care again not something you want to have a, a, a tube into their bottom that could potentially harm them if they start thrashing around or getting aggressive so when we're assessing temperature the next one we're going to look at is um, axil axillary so the axilla is under the arm, so doing an axillary temperature is putting that thermometer underneath the arm. It's considered the least accurate. Um, it's, it's usually about a degree less than the oral temperature, where that rectal is a degree higher. Um, but if you've recently bathed them, or you wiped, or let's say you had to wipe, their armpits were all sweaty, so you wiped their armpits before you put the um, temperature in there, that's going to, that friction is going to increase the heat. Um, so you want to make sure the skin is clean and dry, that you haven't just bathed them or just rubbed underneath your arm. And, um, and any time you take a temperature, you, like you take it rectally, you want to mark that you did it rectally so the person knows, oh, hey, I'm looking at a degree higher, but it was done rectally, so that's what we expect. If you do it axillary, oh, gee, it's lower than it has been, but if we mark down that it's axillary, then, you know, we've made a notation, we know why it's lower. Now, tympanic is in the ear, and you um, there are actually individual probe covers that go over this tip part of the ear. Um, it's not used if the person has an ear disorder or ear drainage. So if they have, um, they're there because they have an ear infection or their ear's been bothering them in some reason, we don't want to obviously stick something in their ear that could cause them more discomfort. We generally pull the ear up and back. So for an adult, you actually take the ear and you pull it up and back because it will kind of make the ear canal a little bit more of a straight shot. And it's very easy. It's very quick. Um, you put this probe part into the ear. You press the button and within three seconds, you have a reading. And so the nice thing with it is it works for patients that are young or old, confused or unconscious. Um, they don't have to follow directions for you to be able to do this. There's less pathogens than oral or rectal route. Smoking, drinking, eating doesn't affect it. So we used to use it so probably about, oh gosh, 10, 15 years ago when tympanic thermometers became really prevalent. I remember the hospital where I was working, they bought a ton of tympanic thermometers and we loved them. They worked great. Um, as a matter of fact, when we trialed them originally, we took the temperatures orally and we took a tympanic to compare. They were really accurate, and so we were just thrilled with them. But it seemed like within a few years, all of our tympanic thermometers were broken. They weren't working properly anymore. So we went back to the good old standard oral thermometers. Um, but now they have temporal, and temporal seems to be the most common way you're generally going to see a temperature taken nowadays. So the temporal ones, have a, it's kind of like a rubber foam part right here on the, at the end of it. And they do actually um, make some little probe covers for them, but you can also just clean them and wipe them down in between your residence with um, an alcohol wipe. 
you press the button the entire time you're running it across the temporal thermometer or the temporal forehead. We, I'm sorry, you you hold the button down the entire time you're running it across the forehead to take the temporal thermometer. And then some of the manufacturers recommend that you also touch behind the ear. So generally, so the, the so this kind right here, which is the kind that we have at, um, the, at one of the hospitals I work at, you put the temporal thermometer, you put this round part flat and flush right here across the forehead, and you rub it, you go all the way across, actually all the way over to here in the hairline. Because your temporal thermometer actually comes, it kind of comes up your face and then it kind of branches, it kind of branches up this way and up and over across your forehead. So they actually want you to rub it from here all the way over here. And then the manufacturer of the one that we use, it also says to pick it up, still holding the button here with your thumb, and touch up behind the ear. And so when I started teaching this class in your book, it just talks about running it across the forehead. And some manufacturers, that's all they recommend is running it across the forehead. And I remember the hospital where I was working at, they also rec the manufacturer recommended touching behind the ear. So I actually had my students one semester do this where they just ran it across the forehead and then they did it again, running it across the forehead and touching right behind the ear. And I think it was like one-tenth of a degree higher when they did it that way. I don't know if it's super critical that it's done that way, but usually you, you run it all the way across the forehead and that way for sure you'll hit some part of that temporal artery. Nowadays, you see a lot of the temporal artery ones are infrared, and I can't say I'm a huge fan of them because I have done them with, and I'm sure they're going to improve as over the next year or two, especially with COVID-19. They're trying to do touchless, you know, thermometers. But as a general rule, um, the infrared ones are usually picking up lower readings than what you get when you're actually doing the temporal thermometer across the forehead. But the nice thing about this is it works on children, it works on adults, it works on elderly. It doesn't matter if you've had anything to eat or drink, doesn't matter if you have an ear infection, doesn't matter if you're conscious, unconscious, can follow directions, combative. It's a pretty easy way to do it and you're not gonna hurt the person, okay, even if they're fighting you for some reason. So another type of thermometer is these tempa dots and there's all these little tiny dots on them and they increase by two tenths of a degree. You stick this under the person's tongue for about a minute and the dots will start turning blue and where it quits turning blue, that's what the temperature is. They actually, I mean, for these little tiny cheesy pieces of plastic, they're fairly accurate. And then this kind right here actually goes across the forehead. Um, we use these in surgery. It just they, These only go by increments of two degrees. So this is not an accurate temperature measurement, but it gives you an idea of how cold they are. So these, these squares turn colors um, so if you put this across the person's forehead and it changes colors up to here, you know the temperature is at least 98.6, but you know it isn't as high as 100.4. Okay, so it gives you an idea of where your temperature is. And they kind of like these in surgery because in surgery they make the room so cold, the rooms are just so stinking cold, that it really cools the body temperature down and they're, they don't want to make it too cold for the person. And then there's these little portable digital thermometers that they do make little plastic sheaths for. This is what a lot of people would have for home use. So we'll go on to pulse next. And so with the pulse, um, arteries carry blood away from the heart to all parts of the body to carry oxygen and nutrients to the tissues and the cells of the body. The pulse is the beat of the heart felt at an artery as the wave of blood passes through it. So you feel a pulse when you're pressing that artery up against the bone, with every time your heart beats, it should produce a pulse. Okay. So it's a really great indicator of how many times your heart's beating, and you can calculate that per minute, which is generally how we check a pulse for. The most common place we check for a pulse is in the brachial artery. I'm sorry, <laughs> radial artery, sorry about that. Most common place we check it for routine vital signs is the radial artery brachial artery, which is right here, is what we check before we do blood pressure so we know exactly where we want to put our stethoscope. Sorry about that. So the pulse rate is how many times our heart beats in one minute. The adult rate range is 60 to 100. Now this is an adult rate range. We will talk about children. Children's heart rates are much faster than adults, but we are going to be focusing more on the adult ranges. Um, and as far as testing purposes go, I'm looking that you, you should memorize your adult range. You should know that children are generally faster. Okay. 
over 100 for an adult is considered tachycardia. Tachy means fast, cardia means heart, so fast heart. And below 60, so 60 is normal, 59 and lower would be a bradycardia. Brady is slow, cardia is heart. So our normal pulse rate ranges, it varies for the age, but usually in infants we see it, the low end would be 80 in, in infants, and usually 180 to 190 is pretty typical. So with right about 140, 160 being fairly average. So that's our normal range with infants. By two years of age, it slowed down a little bit. 80 is still the slow end, but usually 160 is going to be the upper end of it. From four to nine years old, 75 to about 120. From 10 to 12 years old, 70 to about 110. And then usually by the time they get over 12 years of age, they're about adult range right there. So 60 to 100. So there are different pulse sites, um, and a pulse site is anywhere the artery lays close to the surface over a bone. So there is temp the temporal artery. So again, the temporal artery, it kind of goes up the forehead and it sort of just kind of branches out over here. If you've ever had a really bad headache where it just felt like your head was just like boom, 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 right? And if you put your fingers here, you can actually just feel it just pulsing. That is your temporal artery. The carotid artery is here in the neck. So it's where you swallow, is where that lump that Adam's apple is, and you slide into the groove, is your carotid artery. It's usually taken in life-threatening emergencies. So this is usually the artery where we're going to feel if we're trying to determine if somebody still has a pulse or not, if we're going to start CPR. We would usually check the carotid artery. The brachial artery is right here at the bend of the elbow. Now it's sort of, it kind of runs, it actually kind of runs along your arm. Your brachial artery actually kind of runs down your arm and it kind of crosses over right here at the bend of the elbow. So generally right up above the bend. So if, I, if you bend the person's arm, so you're right up above this bend and you slide into this groove right here, you will usually feel it. But don't be afraid to press deep especially if the person has bigger arms, they're muscular, or they're overweight. You, sometimes you have to really kind of press in there and to find it. Generally, the brachial artery is the one that we are going to try to find um, so we'll know where to put our blood pressure cuff. The radial is the most common one we do for routine vital signs. And so that one is on the thumb side, so it's on the inner part of the wrist, on the thumb side of the wrist. And so it is usually, and again, don't be afraid to press down because you really need to press that artery up against the bone so you can feel it. And so then as the blood's trying to push through it, since you're pushing against the bone, you will feel it pulse in your fingers. So that's the most routine one that we check for vital signs. The femoral artery is right here at the bend of the leg. Okay, so the femoral artery is right at the bend of the leg. And um, sometimes, again, you would have to press deep. Popliteal is behind the knee. So popliteal is behind the knee here. And this one's a little harder to find. And then the dorsalis pedis is on top of the foot and the posterior tibial is on the inner aspect of the ankle. So the inside of the ankle, just below the ankle bone. And so why would we ever need to look for some of these? So the femoral artery is actually, when we have a person who comes into the hospital in a cardiac arrest, or somebody's checking carotid pulses and somebody's checking femoral pulses because sometimes when a person's system is starting to shut down, it's really hard to feel those pulses. And we wanted to and femoral pulses and carotid pulses are considered central pulses. But popliteal behind the knee, not one that we normally go for, but dorsalis pedis and posterior tibial we do. So let's say for instance your person, let's say your patient had a cast on their leg. And so the cast is coming to about here. We're going to see if we can feel that pulse right there at the opening of the cast to make sure blood's actually coming down past that point. And we'd also check for the toes for circulation. Or let's say the person had a knee replacement. We would want to make sure that circulation is coming past the site of the surgery, below the site of the surgery. So we would check the dorsalis pedis or the inside here of the posterior tibial. So it's it's a really good indicator if blood is getting all the way down to the, our lower extremities. Things that can influence a heart rate, exercise. So when we exercise, our heart rate will go up, and we expect that. So when I told you a rate over 100 is a tachycardia, 
So if I'm exercising and I'm going 120, it's okay that I'm in a tachycardia because I know why it's happening and I'm purposely trying to do it. Age. As we get older, so with kids, we said heart rates are very, very fast. Um, then when we hit adult, you know, actually over the age of 12 in our adult range, we're usually 60 to 100. It is not unusual when we get elderly for it to be up on the upper end of that, you know, closer to that 90 to 100 range is, isn't going to be that unusual. Physical condition. So the more physically fit you are, your heart doesn't have to pump as frequently to get blood everywhere. So the more physically fit you are, your heart rate is usually slower because it doesn't have to pump as frequently to get as much blood and oxygen because the heart muscle is nice and muscular. If you're out of shape, your heart rate tends to be a little bit faster. Um, when you're in the heat, temperatures usually go up. And fever, again, temperature, heat. Okay, so usually with fevers, your heart rate goes up. Now, medications can cause the heart rate to go up or down depending on what kind of medication it is. So a medication, for instance, um, let's say you're taking um, pain medicines. Okay, let's say you're taking narcotics, you're taking pain pills. Those can naturally slow the heart rate down. Okay, they naturally tend to slow the heart rate down. Um, and it's something that we have to be careful with because we're giving somebody a lot of pain medications. So we want to make sure we don't slow it down too much. There are some medications we give people. So for instance, a person who's having an asthma attack sometimes or a person who's having an allergic reaction. If you have an allergic reaction, we tend to give you adrenaline to help combat the allergic reaction. That can make your heart rate go really, really fast. So sometimes medications can impact that heart rate. And fear or anger tends to raise the heart rate up. So I do want to say here, exercise, can, so, so we're talking about these things that can make our heart rate go up, um, heat, fever, fear, anger, also bleeding. Bleeding can make the heart rate go up as well. So I guess the thing I want to want you to understand is when we say a normal heart rate for an adult is 60 to 100 beats per minute, that's at rest. So if your patient's up and exercising and our heart rate goes up, I'm not going to be overly stressed about it. But if your patient is at rest, Okay, and I'm not saying they just got back into bed after exercising for the first day with physical therapy. I'm saying they're, they're at rest, they haven't been doing any activity, and you go in and check your vital signs and their heart rate's 110, 115. Why? That is not normal. Are they running a fever? Are, you know, are, they, are they overly stressed or afraid for some reason? Are they bleeding somewhere? I mean, we need to look at those things. We need to try to figure that out because it is not normal to have a fast heart rate at rest. Some characteristics of the pulse. So the volume. So when we feel the pulse, when we're checking somebody, so if I'm checking the radial artery right here, and you guys, when you check somebody's pulse, we always check with our fingers, not our thumb, because our thumb actually generates its own pulse. So when I'm checking with the fingers and I'm pushing that artery up against the bone, the first thing I want to look at is the volume, the force or the strength of the pulse. Okay, is it nice and strong? Is it weak? Okay, can I barely feel it? Or is it just boom, boom, boom? I mean, that would be the volume, the force or the strength of it. And you know what? I can't tell that without touching the person. I can hook somebody up to a heart monitor and I can tell the rate, or I can put, hook someone up to a heart monitor and it'll tell me the rhythm if it's regularly spaced. But the only way you can tell the volume of somebody's heart rate is to actually feel for it. So volume is force, rhythm is, is it regular? Is there equal spacing between the beats? So is it skipping beats? Is it speeding up and slowing down? Those are things we would want to know. Now we can tell that with our fingers or if we hook them up to a heart monitor, we can see it on the heart monitor as well. Um, but when you do vital signs on an electric machine, because we are going to be teaching you in clinical how to use a, um, how to use an electronic vital sign machine. And I know most of the CNAs do use the electronic vital sign machine. That electronic machine is, can tell you the number. It can tell you the rate and that's all it can tell you. It cannot tell you the volume. It cannot tell you the rhythm. Now, a heart monitor can also tell you the rhythm, but volume and rhythm generally, you just unless you touch your patient, unless or unless they're hooked up to a heart monitor, you're just not going to know those things. 
When we measure a radial pulse, so I said use your fingertips, two to three fingertips, um, on the thumb side of the wrist. So we're going to be on the thumb side of the wrist, on the inner part of the wrist. Um, and we're going to check quality. So we're going to check, is it strong? Is it weak? So what is the volume of that, of that pulse? We're going to count how many beats do we have in 30 seconds. So we're going to count how many beats we have in 30 seconds. Now what I find a lot, and then you can multiply by two. That way you know how many per minute. If it's irregular, if the spacing is like it's speeding up, slowing down, speeding up, slowing down, you need to check it for one full minute. Okay? And if you get the skill for state competency, this is a skill of state competency, and it's probably, believe it or not, it's one of the most common skills that somebody fails for state competency. For state competency, you are required to do it for one full minute. And you have to be within four of your evaluators, so you'd be checking on one side, someone else is checking on the other side, to com your evaluator's checking on the other side, and you compare them. Um, but for most patients, if the heart beats regular, we do it for 30 seconds and we multiply by two. But don't sit and stare at your watch. What happens is people are doing this and then they're looking at their watch, and after a while you start counting the second hand on your watch versus actually counting what you're, what you're feeling. Um, and then again, after we're done, we wash our hands and we record our findings as soon as possible. So we don't forget what it is. Now you'll notice here that this person is actually checking the person's pulse and he's actually got his fingers kind of right there up against the chest. This is actually a nice way to do it because when we start learning about respirations, we're going to tell you with respirations you want to um, have the person still think you're checking pulse but while you're actually counting respirations and if you've got your hand resting there like that, you can actually, even with your fingers, you can feel the chest go up and down as well as see it, hopefully. Now, an apical heart rate is actually listening to the heart rate with a stethoscope. So we will be teaching you how to use a stethoscope with these vital signs. And when you put the stethoscope in your ears, um, you can actually, you, we can use the um, flat part of the stethoscope, put it up against the heart, and we will actually hear the heartbeat. What you're hearing when you hear sounds with the heartbeat, it sounds almost kind of a lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. Lub dub is one. And what you're hearing is the closure of the heart valves. You have valves in your heart. You have two valves between the atria and the ventricles and two valves from the ventricles to the body. When those valves open and close, so that so the atrioventricular valves, the ones in between the atrium ventricles, they open and close at the same time. The ones between the ventricles and the great vessels open and close at the same time. When the valves close, that makes the noise. So when you're hearing lub dub, lub dub, it's those valves, it's the heart contracting, you know, it's, it's the parts of the heart contracting. Um, when we do an apical heart rate, we count it for one full minute, one full minute. We want to protect the patient's privacy, so we should have them back in their room uh, with the privacy curtain pulled because it's best to. If they have a lightweight shirt on, you'll probably be able to hear through it, but you may actually have to lift the shirt up or the gown up so you can put the stethoscope directly on the skin. Most of the time you will hear it best in the fourth intercostal space to the left of the sternal border. So it's kind of almost over, it's, it's usually just right below nipple line on the left hand side. Works fine for a guy, but if you have a woman with large breasts, you may not hear it well there. You may need to just keep moving it over until you find a place where you can hear it good. And sometimes you might be asked to help do what we call an apical radial pulse, and that takes two people. So two people have to do the apical radial pulse, and ideally it should be equal. Um, if it's off by one or two, we usually just figure it's kind of a miscounting. Uh, the start or stop was a little bit off. But what happens is one staff member checks the apical heart rate, listens to the heart rate with the stethoscope, and one checks the radial pulse. To, and so one counts the heart rate here, and then one counts the heart rate here, because we're trying to make sure that everything from here got all the way down to here. And you, and you, you take your apical heart rate and you subtract the radial heart rate if they're different, and that is what we call your pulse deficit. So let's say, let's say you and I were both checking um, an apical radial pulse, and I'm listening apically, and I got 86, and you're, so I've got my stethoscope here, you've got your hands here, and I say, okay, we're going to start now. And so we both start counting at the same time, and we stop at the same time. 
And so let's say I heard 86 for the apical heart rate, but you only got 82, okay? So 86 apical heart rate minus the 82 that you got, we would have a pulse deficit of four, meaning four beats from here didn't make it all the way down to here. They weren't strong enough to come all the way down to here. Now, if we were checking this, so let's say we were doing this apical radial pulse thing, and you're getting 86 here, and I'm getting 82 here, we just did something wrong. Okay, one of us counted wrong, because there is no way that this can be higher than this. Okay, so, um, so it takes two people to do an apical radial um, pulse check, and we take the difference between the two, and that would be our deficit if there is anything. Uh, pedal pulses I mentioned right here on the top of the foot. So pedal pulses are right here. The posterior tibula is right here on the inner aspect of the ankle, just below the ankle bone. And again, if we are trying to check to make sure, like after a leg, knee, ankle injury, surgery to the knee or the ankle, we want to make sure that the blood is getting past that surgical site down to the rest of the tissues down there. So we check the pulses here, we check their color and sensation of their toes to make sure everything looks okay. Now if you're having a hard time feeling it, like it really took you a long time to find it, and it's something you're supposed to check frequently after surgery, you can just put an X, you can find it and just mark an X on it so that way you'll know where it is for the next time. You literally just take a pen and mark an X on their pulse. Um, a Doppler is an, like an ultrasound machine. It's a, it, it will pick up the sound waves from the blood going through the artery. So if you really can't feel it, you can actually put a Doppler, which will hear the sounds as the blood's going through those arteries and amplify that sound for you. So sometimes we can check it with a Doppler as well. Okay, we're going to take a slight pause here.